So this video was going to be from the landscape, another landscape video, probably a, a photo free challenge from the landscape. But we're going through a bit of a heat wave here in the UK at the moment. So it's 30 degrees outside, there's blue skies, blue skies from dawn to dusk. I don't do heat and I definitely don't do blue skies. So instead I thought I'd do one in the office where I've got to have the windows closed because it's so noisy and I can't have the fan on because that's noisy. And I've got this big light here generating even more heat. So it's still probably about 30. This wasn't such a good idea, was it? Anyway, you clicked on this video because you want to shoot images with impact. You want to shoot images that you can print really big and you want to shoot images that have that wow factor. So let's talk panoramics. Here's my five steps to amazing panoramics. Step one, shoot film. Well, this is an odd one to start off with, I know, but bear with me because I think it's important to understand how panoramics used to be captured. So before digital, all panoramics were captured on film and in a way it was a much easier way to do it. Now I had the uh, medium format version, which was the Fuji TX617. But it was also uh, 35 millimeter versions, which is the Hasselblad X-Pan and even rotating cameras, which was the Noblex brand. Now the thing with shooting film is that panoramics were so much easier to capture. It was just one shot, one composition, but obviously it was a lot costlier, at least one pound per shot, probably more if you include processing. Of course, you can still buy these cameras second hand, but it was an easier way of doing things. It was an easier way to capture the image. Photoshop's really good these days, but it can muck up some of the images. There are certain panoramics that just won't handle. It just can't stitch together quite rare but it does happen. So shooting film was the easier way, it was the only way but now with digital it's more accessible and cheaper but there are more steps involved before you get your panoramic image. And I for one really did enjoy shooting panoramics this way. I probably did shoot more panoramics when I had my film camera than I do with digital just for that ease of use. So there is still the option to do that if you so choose. Okay, so that was the old way. So let's rewind and go back to number one, shooting panoramics with digital. So with digital, you don't have to buy a separate camera to shoot panoramics. You can use the camera you've got. So how do you actually shoot a panoramic? So the first thing you do is you put your camera. So the first thing you do is to put your camera in the vertical format. Got my camera here that's camera, that's vertical. So you shoot in the vertical format, not horizontal. And that's because you want to use all the pixels that are in the vertical format for maximum height, and then you pan across to do the panoramic. So you set up your frame so you have the left-hand side of the scene and the right-hand side, and you pan your camera across to capture that whole scene. So I find I usually do around 10 images per panoramic. And what I'm trying to do each time as I move the camera is to overlap the images one third. And that makes it easier for Photoshop to stitch those images together when you've got the pictures on the computer and the software is doing its magic. And it is magic, black magic at least. So as I say, it's around 10 images for the average panoramic. And I actually start my panning from before the scene I want to capture and then just after, because that gives me just a little bit of breathing room to crop down the image for the final shot. The other thing I do, let me just put the camera down, is that I put my hand into the shot and take a picture of my hand before and after I've done the panoramics. That's because if I'm doing a set of panoramics from the same scene, I might be doing some bracketing shots, or I might do a couple of versions. If you put your hand in before and after the panoramics you've just shot, when you're looking at all those images, all those 10 sets of images in multiple sets, if you've done lots of shots, you're going to see where the starting point and the ending point for each of the set of panoramics. It makes it much easier to find those 10 that you're going to choose from a set it could be 40, 50 or 60. So that's a good little tip. Okay, step two, the Noga point and other stuff. Okay, there's two things you really need to think about when making a panoramic and to make a perfect panoramic. The first one is to make sure that the camera is centered over the very center of the tripod. So this is why an L bracket is well, I haven't got my L bracket on here. The L bracket will be there. The L bracket is good and a ball head is good because then you can place the camera vertically on the L bracket and also have it over the center of the tripod, which you would do on a ball head. You don't want to be putting the ball head or a three-way head onto its side so it knocks the camera off the center of the tripod. It's important to keep that camera 
over the center of the tripod so it pans around nicely. So the second thing is the nodal point and using a nodal slider. So what you're trying to do as well as having the camera directly over the center of the tripod, you want the lens opening directly over the center of the tripod as well. When the camera is sat on an L bracket, the actual camera body is sat over the center of the tripod and you want the lens. So you put the camera on a nodal slider, so you can slide the camera back to place the center of the lens, the opening of the lens over the center of the tripod. Again, this is all for accuracy to get that perfect panoramic. So this is my nodal slider, it's just one I've made up myself. And as you'll see, I've got some markings on here which show my uh, positions for different lenses. And that's an important point. That nodal point is different for each lens you use. That's partly the reason I use prime lenses when I'm shooting panoramics. Now, if you're using a zoom lens, even though it's just one lens, each of the different settings, each of the different focal lengths within that zoom will have a different nodal point. It doesn't matter that it's the same lens, each different focal length setting in that zoom will have a different nodal point setting. And that is another advantage, for there are many, why I shoot with the Olympus cameras. It's a mirrorless camera, so the distance between the sensor and the opening lens is shallower. And because I use prime lenses, which are smaller on the Olympus cameras, I find I can actually get away without using a nodal slider, just because the distance is so minimal anyway. But why do we even need a nodal slider? What's its actual purpose? Well, the easiest way to explain it is to look at how we actually set up the nodal points for each lens. Well, as I say, it's about parallax error. So if I put my two fingers up here, one behind the other, and if I didn't have the nodal slider set up properly, let's line those up, just there. When I pan the camera around, that was what would happen as I pan the camera around. You get parallax error. Those two fingers should stay behind one another. But if I was using a nodal slider and had it set up correctly, when I panned the camera around, my fingers would stay behind one another, and not separate. That would be correct in parallax error. So the easiest way of seeing this is by setting it up to adjust those nodal settings. So what I usually do is get two pens or pencils and stick them to either end of my kitchen table. So then set up the camera on the tripod and I move the nodal slider underneath back and forth until those two pencils or pens stay aligned as I pan the camera around. If they go out of line, you move the slider and the camera back a bit, and when they stay in line, you know you've got your setting just right. Simple as that. Oh, cool fan time. Bear with me a second. Oh, that's nice. Okay, with that technical stuff out of the way, let's look at some of the other factors. Oh, well, remember, the nodal slider is if you really want to set your camera up perfectly. You don't have to do it and you'll still get good panoramics, usually without it. But if you want to do it the proper way, that's the way to do it. So some of the other important stuff when setting up the camera to do a panoramic. But the first thing to do is make sure your camera is nice and level. When you pan the camera around, make sure it's nice and level and it's not dipping down one side or the other. So get your tripod nice and level. The second thing is, is to make sure your camera's in total manual mode. Manual exposure, manual focus, manual white balance. You want all the images to be exactly the same. No changes between each of the pictures. You don't want the camera refocusing. You don't want the white balance changing. You don't want the exposure changing. Every image needs to be the same. So set the whole thing to manual. Now, of course, you don't have to use a tripod. Again, it's the best way to do it. It's the proper way to do it. You can actually shoot handheld. And Photoshop is really good these days. It will stitch together an image that hasn't been absolutely perfect. So, you know, if you don't get your tripod, don't think you can't shoot panoramics. Just make sure you try and get it as accurate as possible. And of course, you could even just use your phone. Most phones have got a panoramic mode and it shows you how to put the image together as you're panning across, it stitches it all in camera. Panoramics are so easy these days, it's brilliant. Brilliant! Okay, step three, composition. But the most important thing about shooting panoramics is that you've got to think about composition. Don't just go to the top of a hill or a mountain and shoot a panoramic, especially those very long skinny ones. They just don't work. Well, they work, but they're not very interesting as a composition. You've got to think about composition. You've got to think about depth. You've got to think about foreground. All these things still apply as they would in the other picture you do in a panoramic. It still all applies. The thing you've got to remember is that the viewer will read that picture from left to right even more than your standard horizontal rectangle. And so you've got to set up the view, set up the composition so that viewer can read the picture, view the picture from left to right. 
And remember, not every view will suit a panoramic. Just the same as some scenes are a horizontal, some work as a vertical, some shoot as a square, but some don't. So don't think that every view will be ideal for a panoramic. Now the best thing to do is to stay with some of the standard formats, and they are either three to one or two to one. Three to one being a wider, three to one letterbox ratio, and two to one being a slightly smaller, but still panoramic format. So try not to go beyond that three to one ratio. If you're going much wider, you're gonna to go to five, seven, nine to one ratio. It's just a long, skinny panoramic. You're not gonna have any foreground in there, and what you're gonna end up, unfortunately, it's just a very boring picture. So that's how you shoot panoramics. So for the next step, let's look at a slightly different format. Vertical panoramics. Okay, so everybody knows the horizontal panoramic format. It's kind of how we see the world really, a very horizontal wide view. But you can do them in vertical as well, and they do look very impressive. But they are more difficult to shoot, but quite easy to shoot actually, but they are difficult to compose. So. First of all, instead of having the camera in the vertical format, you keep it in its horizontal format and you just tilt the camera up and down. It's the composition that makes it more difficult because you're gonna get a lot of sky and a lot of ground in your shot. So you're not composing the landscape, you're composing the sky and the ground. So there are only very select subjects that will suit a vertical composition. But it's definitely worth giving it a try because it gives a very different look, a very different panoramic, a very amazing looking panoramic. Oh, it's fan time again. Has this made my voice go funny? Have I got a funny voice? Okay, for the final step, let's look at stitching all those images together in Photoshop. So basically, Photoshop or Lightroom does this all for you now. It used to be a bit of a complicated process, but now it's just the click of a button. So the first thing to do is to edit all those 10 images you captured for the panoramic. So you batch process them, so they're all processed exactly the same as each other. Then it's just a case of going for the merge option. Merge! Selecting all those images, click the button and let Photoshop do its job. Now when you stitch all those images together, you may get what is known as the bow tie effect, where the image looks wider on the outside and goes narrow on the middle. And that's usually because you haven't used a nodal slider and that's Photoshop compensating for that. Now Photoshop and Lightroom have got so good these days that it'll even correct that and it's called boundary warp. You just select that and the software will correct that bow tie distortion. Amazing. Oh, one other tip, when you're doing pictures of water, try to do a long exposure of that water. When you do a shorter exposure, you pick up the ripples. And Photoshop does have a tendency to struggle putting images together that feature ripples. Now, the only difference between Photoshop and Lightroom, because I don't actually use Lightroom for processing my images, I use Adobe Camera Raw and Photoshop, but I've actually found that Lightroom does a better job of stitching together and creating a panoramic. I don't know why that is, because they're both using the same processing engine, but I've just found that Lightroom does a better job with panoramics. So if you're shooting panoramics and you haven't tried Lightroom, give that a try. Okay, so that's my guide to shooting amazing panoramics. Now you can learn more about shooting panoramics by reading my Technique e-guide on shooting panoramics, which is available as part of my E6 subscription. And you can also see the three-part video that I did of shooting panoramics down in London, because panoramics aren't just about the landscape. And you can see that in the link up there. So shoot wide, shoot panoramic. It's what digital was made for.